Hi everyone and welcome to this week's World's End History Story. This week I am covering some of the details of some of the smaller disasters that took place at World's End Colliery. Some of them have little to no detail which is very sad as those who died cannot be remembered as easily as those who have been named. I do hope however that you will still find this video interesting. I know I have said this before, but collieries were a massive part of the history of Wall's End. The opening of collieries brought workers to the area and they, in turn, spent their money here, thus leading to more shops opening, more houses being built and also the prospect of other jobs in the area too. That said, it is still true to say that a lot of colliery owners made a massive amount of money and lived in big fancy houses. One of them even lived in a castle. While their workers lived in tiny cramped homes with most likely only enough money to keep their family in a very basic manner. And often almost all of the male members of the family, including young children, would work in the local pits. It's also safe to say that some of the colliery owners did not know a lot about safety in the mines. Collieries were often put up for sale, and this didn't always mean that someone of great experience was going to buy it and run it well. They were, after all, known as businesses that could make vast amounts of money for their owners, so often this was all the prospective buyer was interested in. But although this wasn't always the case, you still found that even with the collieries that were well run and well managed, with people like John Buddle in charge, there would still be accidents. Because, as the word suggests, they were just that, accidents. Mines could be checked before work began, but the conditions could change quickly, and sadly explosions were commonplace. And this video is simply covering the recorded dis disasters where one or more of the men were killed. As sad and tragic as it is, we must never forget that our town was built partly on the colliery business, and those who died should never be forgotten. One of the first recorded disasters at War's End Colliery dates back to 1767. Sadly, this is a disaster that is not covered anywhere that I have searched. There are no details of what happened or how many men lost their lives. It is simply recorded as having happened. But because it is classed as a disaster, we have to assume that more than one person would have lost their lives. It is sad to think that these poor souls have not been named, but often records going back this far were poorly kept or lost over time. This is also the case for the next disaster which took place in 1785. It is not known whether this was it is known that this was an explosion, sorry, and that two lives were lost, but sadly no names are known. It also made me wonder if it was possible that more had taken place that had not been correctly recorded, as there is such a large gap between 1767 and 1785. But I do doubt that this would be the case, as it does seem that records were kept in some small way of all the disasters that had taken place. The next disaster to take place at Walls End Colliery was in April of 1786. Again, very little in the way of details can be found of this disaster. It was described as being an explosion and six lives were lost. And those who died in this explosion were Ralph Dixon, Charles Dodds, Joseph Dodds, Matthew Elliott, Mark Madison and James Patterson. Their ages, and if they were married or not, is sadly unknown. It was stated that the burial place of these six victims is unknown. However, at this time, the only location for burial in Wall's End would have been Holy Cross. St Peter's was a long way from being built, and the burial ground at Holy Cross would have surely still been in use at the time. So based on this, we can assume that these men would have been buried there. It's worth remembering, as I have mentioned before, the burial ground surrounding Holy Cross ruins was much larger than the fenced off area we see today. But sadly, no real records of grave locations seem to be known, so it would be almost impossible to locate the exact area where these poor men were buried. <laughs> 
And I know I will mention this location again, Holy Cross Ruins, for other burials. It is also possible that some may have been buried on the south side of the Tyne, as it was known for some people of War's End to be buried across the water, as the Tyne at the time could be easily crossed by boat and sometimes even stepping stones, as it was much wider and shallower than it is today, and there was a larger burial area on the other side of the water. The next disaster to occur, to occur at War's End Colliery was on October in October of 1790. Sadly, once more, this is a case of the names of those who died being unknown. This was another explosion, which was a very common case in the collieries, and seven men lost their lives. Again, their burial location is unknown. The next disaster was in September of 1799. Again, this is one with sadly no known details, and of the 13 men who died, only seven of their names are known, and they are Christopher Barris, who was 20 years old, Thomas Burbeck, who was 20 years old, Thomas Holmes, who was 18 years old, John Lee, who was 14 years old, Thomas Morrow, who was 30 years old, John Ward, who was 37 years old, and Joseph Wilson, who was 13 years old. Again, their burial location is unknown, but once again, it is possible that they would have been buried at Holy Cross Ruins. Another disaster occurred in Ward's End Colliery in September of 1803. This one took place at Sea Pit, or Gas Pit as it was more widely known, which was situated close to where the tennis courts are now in Richardson Dees Park. Not surprisingly, due to its name of Gas Pit, this disaster was caused by a burst of gas, which came from an area above and behind the workers who were in the mine at the time, and on hitting a lamp, it caused the explosion to occur. For those who died, it was mostly caused by suffocation due to the gas, but others, it seems, were burnt. Those who survived, almost 20 men, were some distance away from the explosion, but they had all been burnt by red-hot sparks that had been driven towards them by the force of the explosion. And it must have been absolutely terrifying not knowing if you were going to make it out alive or not. Tragically, 13 men and boys lost their lives in this disaster, and of the 13, only 11 names are known. And they are Ralph Dawson, who was 22 years old, George Foggett, whose age is unknown, Matthew Foggett, who was 14 years old, Jonas Hammond, whose age is unknown, John Han, who was 22 years old, William Kelly, whose age is unknown, Anthony Parkin, who was 18 years old, Thomas Parkin, who was 14 years old, Nicholas Raw, who was 16 years old, John Reevely, who was 16 years old, and Cuthbert Rumford, who was 16 years old. Once more, the burial place of the victims of this 1803 disaster are unknown, and once again, as this was still prior to the opening of the churchyard at St. Peter's, we have to assume that they were also buried at Holy Cross. After this came the disasters of 1821, 1835 and 1838, all of which I have previously covered in other videos, and these three being the ones where many men and boys lost their lives, and the total for these three alone was 165. So it has to be said that in 1838 there was actually only 11 and one of the ones that we have discussed in this video was actually 13 but the later disasters were often more covered in the papers so therefore there was a lot more information for that one than the earlier ones. The final disaster recorded was one which took place in August of 1925 at Edward Pitt. Edward Pitt was located in the area known as Willington Square at the top of what we now know as Churchill Street. And thanks to Malcolm Dunn, I am actually able to show you a photo of this pit. Obviously, you are looking at a photo that shows you the pit wheel more than the full pit. But I hope that you can see it just showing above the rooftops of the houses in the foreground of the photo. 
so it is quite small but the pit wheel is actually visible in the photo this disaster sadly claimed the lives of five men who were peter banks who was 44 years old and married and lived in walker joseph coxon who was 31 years old married and lived in rose hill reginald hogg who was 20 years old and from sherburn village and had been working at Edward Pitt and living in the area at the time, Francis Matthews, who was 17 years old and lived at Benton Way in War's End and is known to have been buried in Churchbank Cemetery, and John George Young, who was 19 years old and lived in North Shields. Many others were injured or affected by the remaining gases in the pit, and some 26 men, most of whom were attempting to rescue those who had been caught in the explosion, suffered from effects from the remaining gases. This disaster, it seems, was possibly one that could have been avoided. It seems several checks were not made, as they should have been, before the miners entered the colliery to begin their work, and this resulted in the mines agent being fined £40 and £14 and 4 shillings costs, and the manager of the mine being fined £50 and £14.16 shillings in cost. This today would have been around £4,100 for the mines agent and around £4,900 for the mines manager. In 1925, the sum of money would have been quite a lot, but when you realise how much it is, it is in today's money, it really does seem very, very little for the loss of those five men's lives, especially when it seems if the correct checks had been made, it may never have happened. And of course, it is very unlikely that those left behind would have received similar sums of money in compensation. There are no further disasters recorded for the collieries of Ward's End. However, this really doesn't give us the full picture of how many people were killed whilst working in the pits, as many were single-person accidents and not classed as disasters, so a full total would be very much higher than the total of 211, which combines all of the main known large disasters. Of course, there were some disasters where the mine workers were rescued, a story of one such case I covered in an earlier video. But sadly, the cases with a happy ending were very few and far between. Life below ground was a dangerous one, and as I have said before, all those who worked the job would have known there was a risk and that they may not go to, that they may go to work and never come home. A lot of my ancestors were miners and I do count myself very lucky that I only know of two who were killed and both of those died in the Hartley Pit disaster of 1862, something that I actually only found out about a couple of weeks ago. I am sure that many of you listening will have had ancestors who worked in the old collieries and some in the more recent times in the 60s etc and some of you may have even worked in the collieries yourselves. Do please feel free to share your stories with me in the comments below. I often wonder how many of us who grew up at a time when coal fires were our only source of heat would have ever stopped to think where that coal actually came from and how many people may have died or been seriously injured in getting it from below ground to our living room fire. I know as a child that certainly was something that never crossed my mind but it certainly would now. And I admire anyone who worked as a miner in the very far past from the late 1700s right up to those who still work there until our last colliery closed in 1969. I do hope that you have found this video interesting. As sad as it is based on the subject matter obviously, it is still very much part of our past. I do thank you all very much for watching and I do hope to see you all again very soon.